so my name is Tracy and it's my pleasure to be here today with all of you as educators uh, partly because I went to U of T uh, for I got my MBA at U of T yeah 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 and I'm also have my Bachelor of Education which is very exciting as a primary junior teacher so I empathize greatly with the seats that you're all sitting in um, but the reason I was lucky enough to be invited here today is as an athlete ambassador and I'm an aspiring Paralympian in sailing is my passion. Uh, and in the past, it was skiing. Uh, and I'm here today representing the Canadian Paralympic Committee to share with you in hopes to inspire future uh, participation in all of your students, not just your kids that have physical disabilities. And so this is the start of our changing minds, changing lives. And so what we'll go through in our next hour together, uh, and I invite questions throughout the hour as well as at the end of the hour, and would love it to be interactive. But sort of how come we're here, and why do we all care, and what is parasport? So a little more detail around parasport. And then what is it that you can do to help invite and involve more kids in physical activity, and then further question and answers throughout that time. So uh, I was born this way. They don't know why. So I'm called a congenital four-way amputee. Uh, so you can sort of see in that picture where I'm rigging my sailboat where my legs are off. I should have wore three quarters or a skirt today. <laughs> and uh, they don't know why. I'm just a fluke. My mom is cheeky enough to say I'm a fluke in more ways than one. <laughs> my British mom, my beloved mom. And so uh, I remember when I first went to elementary school. And it was a few years ago. And at that time, integration wasn't as popular as it is now. And they really encouraged my mom to uh, not have me as a four-way amputee in my kindergarten class. And they said that I needed to go to a special school. And she's like, well, how come? And uh, they said, well, she's got to be able to do her zippers by herself and go to the bathroom by herself. And so mom was really passionate for me. And, you know, I'm this big extroverted kid that says hi to everybody. And my mom was actually and still is very introverted, quiet uh, lady, but not when it came to me. And so she was able to inspire them to give it a try. She said, well, why don't you start, Tracy, for a few weeks and we'll see if it works out. And then if it's not working out, then we'll put her in a special school. And so the very first, mom worked really hard with me to be able to tie my shoelaces and do my zippers and all those things. And so the big success that first day was going to be, could I get myself independently ready in time for kindergarten class uh, and recess and back in again. And so after school, mom was approaching the teacher, and she was looking at the teacher, and the teacher's face was looking mortified, was looking really kind of sad and regretful. And so my mom was thinking, oh, I didn't manage to do it in time, in recess. And so maybe it wasn't so successful. So then she said, so how'd it go? And the teach did Tracy get out for recess? And the teacher shook her head sort of non-verbally. And she said, what happened? And she said, well, Tracy tied her shoelace, and the kid beside her couldn't tie her shoelace. And then nobody could tie the shoelace. So Tracy ended up tying the shoelace of the entire class. <laughs> and by the time she was done, recess was over. <laughs> and so it was really neat that you know, the standard to be allowed to go to school in an integrated classroom was tying a shoelace. And in fact, I was the only kid in the class that could. And so what's so great about integration and opportunity, especially with uh, physicals, and during phys ed, I think most of my phys ed, right through to grade 12, I never once was invited to participate in a phys ed class. Uh, and so by, by the time I hit grade 13, there was a theory of physical activity. Uh, and I, I, I got my recreation diploma from Centennial College first, right after high school. And then I got a rec degree at Brock University and I was uh, lucky enough to travel the world. I worked in Nepal and in Mexico and in Uganda. And in those countries, they didn't really understand a recreation and leisure studies degree and doing leadership development opportunities. So I got my Bachelor of Education so that they could understand in developing countries what it was that I was doing with kids. But of course, I fell in love with teaching. And I was so glad that I got my Bachelor of Education. 
Um, but so recreation and physical participation and teaching kids were in my blood. So when there was a theory of physical education uh, at grade 12, uh, I took that theory course and, and, and did a thesis on the difference between cooperative games and competitive games. And, and, and that's where it sort of fell in love with it all. So physical activity and swimming, and I wasn't allowed to participate in phys ed uh, during my class, which is crazy because I really feel strongly that all people, whether you have a disability or not, have an opportunity to take risks and take safe risk, but to take risks, experience sort of that life lesson of how do you know unless you try? And so recreation, sailing, skiing, all those things that I did as a kid were all because I had an opportunity to take safe risk. And so because I learned to swim uh, in a camp for kids with disabilities, Easter Seal Society, I was allowed to participate in sailing at 11. And because I learned to sail, I was able to be a sailing instructor. And because I was a sailing instructor, I got into Queen's University for my Bachelor of Education. And because I got my Bachelor of Education, uh, I was able to teach at Air Canada. I never dreamt getting primary junior that I'd end up teaching at Air Canada for eight years. And, and because I taught at Air Canada for eight years, uh, I was able to become now an independent consultant doing motivational speaking and visiting classrooms and going to schools and doing uh, workshops with kids, which I love, 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 love. But it all started because I was able to do some swimming. And what a shame that that confidence booster uh, had to come from outside of the school system instead of inside in all of your classrooms. And so uh, my job this past year I was the manager of Parapan Planning and Integration. And uh, it was a fantastic job being able to do the accessibility audits and being the person that helped set up athletes for success coming for these fabulous games. There were over 10,000 athletes here this year, and 1,600 of them were athletes with physical disabilities. Never before have there been 1,600 athletes with disabilities. We had 50 venues involved, if you include the non-competition venues, and it was amazing. So, uh, so will you raise your hand? How many of you are from the Durham, Whitby, Oshawa area? So, so not, not unanimously all of you. So for those of you from this area, or those of you that maybe just happen to know, does anyone know what parasport happened here at the Ability Center? Bocce. Uh, so bocce or bacha. What's so great about bacha is that people of all levels of ability can play bacha. Uh, most of the folks that play bacha are adults with uh, cerebral palsy that probably use a wheelchair. But typically, all four limbs are affected. And some can throw with their hands, some can use a ramp, and I think you're going to get some experience with bacha uh, after our hour is, is done together. So bacha was the para-sport game that happened here at Ability Center, which was fabulous. Fabulous, fabulous. And so what I share with all of you when I started uh, sailing uh, was that I was in a room getting my legs fitted, getting some new legs, and I didn't have my legs on, and I was sitting in the waiting room, and this uh, college student, university student, like yourselves, had a school project. And she came into the Hugh McMillan Medical Center in Toronto, where they make prosthetic legs for kids, and at that time it was called the Ontario Crippled Children's Center, which is amazing in the name change. And it was a perfectly wonderful, inviting, amazing resource of a center. And, and you know, I feel really strongly that language is a function of dignity and respect. And so at the time, there was great dignity in the OCCC, Ontario Crippled Children's Center. Uh, and now we've since learned that, that that word isn't appropriate. And we don't need to sugarcoat it anymore. We sort of, we want to go with person first. I'm a person with a disability, or I'm Tracy with artificial legs, or I'm an athlete that participates in parasport. So whatever the person is first in the sentence. And then that way, whatever word you use, 
you've shown right off the bat that you see me as a human being first. You see, you, you're communicating dignity, even though you might get the word wrong. As long as you say Tracy first, uh, you'll be laughing. And so there was a student, much like yourselves, her final year, she was graduating, she was doing a project and doing a lesson plan, and she decided to turn her lesson plan into a reality. So she went to the Hugh McMillan Medical Center and said, you know, I would love to bring out some kids with disabilities out in a sailboat and do some adaptive sailing. And they said, we're sorry, we can't offer you their names because it's confidential. But I was in the waiting room, and so I bummed on over to her, and I'm like, I want to sail, I want to sail. And I was 11 years old, and so she took me out with all the other able-bodied kids in her sailing class. And that first year, because I, in the boat, I didn't wear my legs because I can't swim with my legs on, and I have to be able to swim. So that first year I was sailing, uh, I kept falling out of the boat. I was a bit like a weeble wobble doll. And so every time the boat would heal, I would go overboard. And I loved to swim, so I didn't mind. I wasn't afraid. It was OK. But at the end of that summer, they awarded me a fish because I spent more time with the fish than I did in the boat. <laughs> and that was fun, and it was super playful. Uh, but all of the other kids, all the other able-bodied kids, they all got a white sail level one uh, because they got to do some of the basics of the sailing. And so what was really amazing and what I ask of all of you as primary, junior, future teachers is just because I was falling out of the boat, it didn't discourage them for, from allowing me and inviting me to come back the next year. And it's so great. And even though I wasn't successful at first, I just needed a little bit more time. And what I did master that summer was I learned how to balance in the boat. Well, the next summer, I went back. And they said, you can come back. And I could understand why a four-way amputee falling out of the boat all the time at 11 years old might be a little bit scary for a program. <laughs> but I'm really glad they had confidence and believed that I was capable of getting there, even though it wasn't evident right away. Because when I went back the second summer, I got my white cell level one, and, and all of us, I also got my white cell level two along with my peers. But what I also did was I got my white cell level three, which a lot of my peers didn't get. I sort of surpassed all my able-bodied kid friends. And so clearly sailing was something that I must have had an aptitude for at an early age, and you never would have seen it from that first summer. And so it's just that that's what I ask of all of you, is just a little patience for people to figure out how their disability reflects in your classroom and let the person master it so that they can get on to maybe surpassing some goals or at least uh, matching everybody. And that happened with my scuba diving. Like a lot of people take four classes and it took me 13 classes before I mastered scuba diving. And when I learned to drive, I did the driver's ed course, but it also took me 13 extra lessons to figure out how I was going to uh, drive and be safe. Uh, but I've never touched wood. I uh, had an accident. <laughs> and so it just took a little more time to get there. But once I get there, it was fabulous. And so w I'll keep interjecting stories along the way, uh, but possibly I should get on, on to some of the real content. And uh, what's so great about sport and parasport and the Canadian Paralympic Committee is that it is so much more, as you're hearing, it became my profession. I only know one word. Faith. Faith. I only know one word. Faith. I will not be stopped. I will not be moved. I will not be told. There's something in my way. I only know one word. Faith. And so what's so great and how we can help all of you be set up for success as future primary junior teachers in the education system and just 
people out and about in the community. Like you have friends, you have family, you have next door neighbors. And so all of you now can be advocates for participation. Uh, and so this is what this session's about, changing minds, changing lives. It's just raising awareness of the value of it all and, and giving you resources. The last slide will repeat that, uh, those lesson plans that Gabriel was talking about for you to be able to, to write down. But my hope is that I excite and motivate you. It was that woman that came in to the, the clinic where I was getting my legs on and said, can I get somebody sailing? And it's, it's like she has no idea the impact that she's had on me today and, and, and that people are making those impressions uh, going forward. And in some ways, I consider myself really lucky that, you know, in kindergarten I had to fight for it because it gave me a chance to be independent and stand out and learn what a great opportunity it is to ha be a resource for others outside of myself. And so it was a lesson that came out of being a person with a disability. But physical activity, as well as sport, is sort of that chance for physical growth, for psychological, social growth. You know, it's from my sailing and my swimming and my skiing that I have so many of my social friends and resources. And so uh, Accessibility Directorate Act, what's really neat is in Ontario, we are the only place in Canada and the entire world that has this goal that by 2025, we're going to be an all-accessible Ontario. That's our goal, 2025. In 2005, they said it. So what's really neat about this year for 2015 is that it's like the 10-year birthday. It's the halfway anniversary of this 20-year goal that they set, that by 2025 we'll be in all accessible Ontario. No other province has it, and no other place in the entire world has that goal. So you're in a unique position to leverage that. There's so many resources with AODA to set you up for success. And so it isn't just about customer service. It isn't just about, you know, I'm allowed to go to Tim Hortons just like anybody else and I'm allowed to participate in kindergarten class just like anybody else, and that I'm allowed to uh, do gym class just like anybody else. Uh, it, it's also employment, transportation, uh, the design of public spaces, and that's what was really great about the Pan Am, Para Pan Am games coming this summer, was because it also raised awareness, and we had to get Ontario and Toronto ready for the thousands, the 250,000 spectators and visitors that were coming uh, to, you know, to get rid of those individual ramps or to move toilet paper to where it's reachable. Do you know 49 out of 50 venues had toilet paper that if your feet weren't on the ground, I couldn't reach? So it's really great that you put a handrail in next to a, a washroom, but what happens is when they put that bar in, that people move the toilet paper out of the way. Well, now you got a bar, but you, you can't reach the toilet paper. And if you can't bear weight, you can't lean forward to get that toilet paper. So my personal request of all of you is to check in your schools and in your placements that there's at least one stall where the toilet paper is reachable without having to wait bare on your feet, <laughs> that you can reach it right from your seat. Uh, because it's a free accessibility intervention. It costs nothing to move the toilet paper reachable. You just have to move it over. And, uh, and that makes a really massive difference in my life as one person example, for sure. And so the Accessibility Directorate of Ontario are actually the ones that help fund part of this Changing Minds, Changing Lives. And they're the ones that designed these very wordy slides and mandated that they must be looking like this. And so uh, I share this to celebrate an appreciation that they do take initiatives to make us more accessible and that they do fund this program. And so there's lots of provincial organizations that they umbrella with to help make this. So Ability Center is on accessibility advisory boards and supports the ADO in meeting their, on their OADO uh, goals. And so 
uh, one example of funding is called the Enabling Change Program. And so it's part of promoting awareness and understanding that there is para-sport opportunities. There are community centers like Ability Center available and out there. And so what's interesting here about this statistic is that not only is it 15% in Ontario, it's 15% in Canada. It comes out about 15% in the United States. It comes out about 15% in Australia. It comes out about 15% in the United Kingdom. So you're starting to see a general trend that it's about 15%. And it has been since about 1998 and till now. It's going up just a wee bit. But what we also know is our aging population and that you know, over the age of 65, 65% of people who are over the age of 65 have some kind of physical impairment. And so we also know that by 2017, people over the age of 65 are going to outnumber our kids under 14. And so this 15% is growing. But the other interesting statistic about the 15% is if someone knocks on my door and says, is there a person with a disability in this household? And I cook for myself, I live on my own, I get dressed myself, I work myself, I drive myself, I'm completely independent, but I am born a four-way amputee and I will self-identify, yes, there's a person with a disability in this house. But if they knock on my Nana's door and she has someone come in and give her meals, she's got some folks that come in and help her medically, she has, uh, she's not able to drive for herself. And if they ask her, is there anybody with a disability in this house, she'll say, no, there's nobody with a disability in this house, because she doesn't see herself that way. And so that's 15.5% of people that self-identify as having a disability. And so it isn't actually the catch-all of everyone. So, so much of it is about, yes, is adapting our environment for people with disabilities, which is a much bigger number and growing than 15%. But the other piece is, is the universal access. You know, Halle Berry, she broke her foot. If she can break her foot, you know, any of us can uh, break our foot. Or people, so who else would be under the caveat of universal access? Who else could benefit from just always having top of mind every day, not just today, but every day, having accessibility kind of top of mind for all of your programming and thoughts and places of business and all of us. Yeah, absolutely all of us. I don't know who said it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Ready, everybody? <laughs> oh, not bad. <laughs> Those are excess appendages again. <laughs> so all of us. And, and so, who, and more, and, and so who, who would distinctly benefit from not having stairs other than people with disabilities? Who else are stairs hard for? Yeah. Children. Children. Yeah. Children. Yeah. Seniors. Seniors. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> pregnant women. Sure. Pregnant women. Yeah. Did you say something? Strollers. So, so many folks with strollers. So even after they've been pregnant, now they got strollers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's like so many folks that will benefit from that universal access lens, which would be so great in your primary junior phys ed class that that becomes part of children's already always thinking about is how to create an accessible, cooperative environment. Not just because people have disabilities, just because it's about universal access and cooperation. And that it isn't about one day's presentation. It's about that it's part of, OK, where are we hosting this? What's the food going to be? And is it accessible? Is it universally accessible? So who, who is captured by? people with disabilities. What kinds of disabilities are there? Yes. Cognitive. There's cognitive impairments. Yep. Yep. Physical, Physical impairments. Yep. 
Yep. Emotional. Yeah. I love, I, so often it's missed the cognitive and the emotional, and that these are in the top three right off the bat. So physical impairment like myself as using prosthetic legs or physical impairment for someone who uses a wheelchair. So we say use the wheelchair. They're not confined to a wheelchair. They're not stuck to the wheelchair. They're not bound to the wheelchair. They use a wheelchair. Most people, even people who are quadriplegic, have all four limbs paralyzed. You know, the wheelchair rugby players, they are quadriplegic, right? Typically have all four limbs. In order to be a ru wheelchair rugby player, AKA murder ball, believe it or not, <laughs> some great movies about murder ball, uh, is that all four limbs have to be affected. But even though they're quadriplegic, they're playing wheelchair rugby. And so, or bocha, you'll, you'll, uh, lots of the bocha players, you're using power chairs. But all those folks, even though quadriplegic, are able to, to wait there and get out of their chair. I know some quads that drive a car, and they put their chair in their trunk, and they, they body surf their car. They use the car as kind of like a brace, a human brace. And they just sort of, they have enough, like, stability and anchoring, like putting their knees facing the car, that they can body surf their car a bit, even though all four limbs are paralyzed, and sit in their car and drive their car. A lot of the wheelchair rugby players do that and get their own wheelchair in the car, even though they're a quad. So that's why it's really important to say use a wheelchair instead of confined to a wheelchair, bound to a wheelchair. Uh, and so we also have people with hearing impairments, people with visual impairments, that it would all be captured by that. And so what's interesting is we've only got statistics for uh, 5 to 54 for adults with a disability, with where the asterisk is, is there. Uh, whereas the able-bodied adults, these folks uh, is spanning the life range. Let me double check this. And so it's even more significant that that 3% is including children. So just to repeat, uh, to be clearer, because I don't feel like I was totally clear, is that this column here are our adults, able-bodied adults, whereas these two are inclusive of kids from five years old. So this 3% is also including children, whereas these numbers are only considering adults. So it's really interesting that only 3% of children and adults with disabilities actually participate in physical sport or physical activity. Uh, and I, for me, it's my lifeline. And for so many people that I know, it's the lifeline. And, and it's the only access to get out and about and socialize. And so many folks that I know that I learned swimming with at four years old with Easter Seals camp that didn't end up being in parasport uh, are now obese and gaining weight because they don't have any physical activity that they're able to participate in. Because you're sedentary with a mobility impairment. It's harder to walk far distances. And then you end up using a chair. And then you're even less active. You're not even just doing your regular walkabout to class and back. And so it's really participation in physical activity that, that facilitates that engagement in society and then inspires you to want to go to school and then want to work and be able to participate. And so it's so much, I would say, it's important for every single human being. But I would also say, and it's a personal opinion, that I think it's like 10 times more important for people with a disability to participate in physical activity because it's a confidence booster and it's a reintroduction back into society. In some ways, I'm lucky to be born this way. But for folks that have acquired a disability later and need to be re-motivated to get back, I think it's also a super important vehicle for getting back and integrated into society and realizing the value of living and life and what you can do and reintroduce that confidence in that social circle. So it's, this is why all of us need to care. And I think what's interesting about para-sport compared to able-bodied sport is so many athletes that reach the Paralympic Committee level 
uh, are older. And I think that's because people acquire disabilities later in life. So you may have a whole bunch of kids in your class and very, a small percentage, possibly 15% of them, may have a visible or invisible disability. But of all of those kids, there's a high likelihood that a good chunk of them are going to end up with, unfortunately, a disability later in life. So not only are you providing great, cool, physical, fun activities that are creative and outside of the box and introducing physical literacy in different ways with all the fabulous lesson plans they provide you online, but you're also letting people know that when something happens to some of your kids, which will happen, that life doesn't end there. There is lots of awareness and opportunity available later. So you're planting those seeds of the unfortunate truth that will come later in life as well. So it's, it's important on that front as well. And so what's this used for? Yeah. Okay. And what's this used for? Wheelchair basketball. Thank you. How about this? What could this be used for? Just play, education, fun. I like it. I like it. What's neat is they are all equipment that anybody could use for physical literacy. Right, that, so that wheelchair, we were saying wheelchair basketball. This particular wheelchair, it's a motivation. The company is called Motivation Wheelchair, and it's a sport chair. What makes this a sport chair? Anybody see some differences between that and everyday chairs? Yes. The, yes. Uh, so yourself or anybody, what do you think uh, doing that provides? Helps with turns, like fast turns. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Can I throw this at you? Trust me. You can trust me because I never get the person. It's everybody else around you. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> yes. Yeah, at the back, right? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yes. Assistance handles. Yes. And so why? Why? Why not? Have you got a notepad already? No, that'd be great. That would be great. Everybody ready? <laughs> yeah. The individuals doing the moving and encouraging the moving. Yeah. To avoid the temptation. You know, I have a whole new found respect for tying my own shoelaces by kindergarten. Because my niece, Maggie, she's eight now, but when she was like four going into kindergarten, she, and none of her kids, and even now, she's terrible at tying shoelaces. And I am so tempted, even though Maggie's got 10 fingers and 10 toes, I want to jump in and help her. And it's so tempting to sit back and, and let her just do it herself and have that patience of time, which is very precious gift as well, but just also not only the time pressure, but to not jump in and help. How actually that's doing a disservice by being too helpful. Yes, so that lesson of independence and encouraging people to be able to do it for themselves. It's very tempting. So well, what I did after I got my rec diploma, before I got my education degree, is I worked for Outward Bound. And the first time I did Outward Bound, it was called Access to Adventure, and there was two or three of us with a disability, and then the rest of the group were able-bodied folk. And that was great, because for portaging, we would have been really up a creek if we didn't have anybody to carry those uh, canoes. <laughs> Thanks for some of you laughing. Uh, that deserves a tattoo. Uh, but what was really cool, the first time I participated in Outward Bound, was there was this big, gigantic cliff. And we had to climb up the cliff, and we had to rappel down it. And I did it with my legs off. And it was amazing. It was so great to be able to be trusted to try it. And we, who knew how far I would get? But I did it. And I was kind of good at it. I didn't have the excess appendages in my way. It would kind of shimmied up pretty well with my, uh, my legs and at my knees. I don't have knees. They're just like, but they're like my arm that goes to my elbow. They're just a bit smaller, and they end at my knee. So it, it worked out great. And when I was repelling, there was a bit of a lip at the top of the cliff. 
And when you repel, you have someone on the other end of your safety line. But of course, when you do all the really cool photographs, it's me that's like hanging there, repelling like Queen Bee and looking all cool from the cliff. But what you don't see in the photograph is the person on the other end of the safety line that's either at the bottom of the cliff or at the top of the cliff. And the reason I share this story with you is when I went over that cliff, I remember just sort of like hanging midair, hundreds of feet in the air, and just stopping, and holy cow, it's high up here, and pausing. And the lady that was my safety line over the top of the cliff, uh, she shouts down to me. She says, Tracy, are you on the ground? I don't have control over you anymore. I'm like, uh-oh, she doesn't have control of me over me. And then I was like, oh, she doesn't have control over me anymore. I'm doing this. And she's my safety line, but it was really me that was repelling and operating those lines. And I just had that revelation of independence. I'm doing this. I can do this. I can do anything. I'm doing this. And who you guys are, you guys are that person on the end of that safety line. You guys are that facilitator of that opportunity to experience that thrill of, I'm doing this. And so, although so many, you know, the profile, personality profile of teachers, especially primary junior teachers, is that they're caring and helpful and loving and nurturing and maybe over helpful. So careful. And, and it's okay. Sometimes you can be super helpful by, by giving me some space to learn for myself and to experience that moment of independence. And, and, and it's wonderful. And it's thank you for wanting to be teachers. I'm very, very lucky. And so this teach this parasport chair is, can be used for wheelchair basketball. It can be used for wheelchair tennis. It can be used for wheelchair rugby. So this is a sport chair, sort of a generic, general sport chair with the extra stability of the wheels as, as our, what's my friend in purple's name? Andrea. Andrea, Andrea pointed out. And so uh, is there another feature that highlights this as a sport chair that you don't see in other wheelchairs? Yes. The bumper bar across the front. The bumper bar across the front. Yes. So protecting the feet, banging into other because people can't feel their feet. And so, uh, and so when you're playing in these sport chairs, as able-bodied folk, you want to have your toes inside. But anybody can play wheelchair basketball. Anybody can play wheelchair rugby. I actually think you have to be paralyzed from the neck down so you don't feel the pain of wheelchair rugby. But if you're willing to take on that pain <laughs> and keep your toes in, then you can play wheelchair rugby or wheelchair tennis. So what's really cool is this is just like, there's a basketball, there's a volleyball net, oh, and there's a sport chair. Like, wouldn't it be great if sport chair was just part of your curriculum and that all the children would have a chance to experience the fun of sport chairs? So Parasport Ontario uh, will certainly loan you wheelchair basketball chairs uh, for something like $100, enough for your whole class. So you could certainly do a day of bringing these chairs into your classroom and into your gym. Uh, but that basically, it's for anyone, for everything. It doesn't have to be for people with disabilities. These are so many of the benefits of having people, all people, with a disability, not with a disability, just universally everyone participating and realizing that everyone and anyone can participate. And that, and that that's how your children, with a disability or not, go into street hockey. What was really neat after the Vancouver Games, after they had aired sledge hockey, was that able-bodied kids all over Vancouver were pulling out skateboards and playing street hockey on skateboards. They were doing imitation sledge hockey on skateboards just because they wanted to play a game. Not because it was sledge hockey, not because they were being super aware. They just wanted to play a new game. It was just street hockey, but on skateboards, which was like sledge hockey. What a cool, you know, accidental offshoot of spreading awareness. And so that's what, what you do. You give kids creative solutions. And then, you know, when I learned to ski, when I first came, I was at was a professional development se seminar. And this man, this really tall man, he was like seven feet tall. He was bald. He was gigantically solid. And he was on the other side of the room. And there was 100 people in the room. And, uh, and I could see him over the room. 
And it was like the parting of the Red Seas. All of a sudden, he, like, he, he, he looked at me and he pointed at me. And it was like we had no reason to be communicating with each other. We were just randomly in this room. And I didn't know why he was pointing at me. But then, having a disability, sometimes it tracks attention and unique behaviors. Maybe that was it. Maybe he knew another amputee or something that he wanted to tell me about. Uh, and so it was like the seas parted. The room just like moved out of his way. And he like stomped across the room and he's like, I'm going to get you skiing. His name was Ian McArdle, Canadian Adult Disabled Ski Program. And Ian, and Ian and said, OK, that sounds great. And I just thought it was a nice thing and that I'd never hear from him again. But I did hear from him again. He did follow up. He did reply. I, I emailed him. He gave me his business card. And what had happened is he had had a car breakdown. And uh, his mechanic didn't have any legs. And his mechanic uh, wore rubber Wellington boots backwards. So by having the foot, the rubber part behind him, it kind of gave him some st stability. And because he was a mechanic and he was underneath cars, he didn't need to be super tall. He was really happy to be down on the ground and laying down on underneath the cars and doing his work. Uh, and what it did is it gave my, my skiing friend Ian the idea that he could get me skiing with men's ski boots backwards. So we got like size 12 men's ski boots and we put my, my thighs, which weren't, weren't like, they're, they're not like super, they're not as skinny as my little arm, but they aren't like your typical thighs, so they're a little bit atrophied. So we got my thighs inside these men's boots and then we changed the attachments of the ski boots to uh, snowboard ratchets and we ratcheted my thigh on super tight in these backward ski boots and we got me snow blades, which are double tipped. Uh, so that it didn't matter which way I was skiing with the snow blades. And uh, I learned to ski with these men's ski boots backwards. Uh, and all because he happened to see this mechanic without legs with rubber wellingtons. And, you know, one idea leads to another idea. The sledge hockey led to the skateboard hockey. And it's just another fun day out. But it's creative problem solving, right? The rubber boots led to the skiing and, and how... Who would have thought that that's how you could get me skiing? And so there's so many creative solutions. Um, when I was in, well, the, uh, I was thinking of, Uganda, I was teaching in Uganda, and I met a little guy named Trevor, adorable. And, you know, in Uganda, because it's a war-torn country, there are lots of people with disabilities. And they did not really notice me as a person with a disability. Like, it was, like, second... It didn't, it wasn't really relevant. And I met this boy, Trevor, without my legs on, sitting in a manual chair. And he wasn't, like it wasn't, he was just in awe. I was in, it was a very remote village. We purposely chose somewhere where uh, teaching programs can't normally get to. Uh, and it was crazy hours and days to get to this northern part of Africa. And so they were saying, Munu, Munu, Munu. And I didn't know what Munu was. And Munu was whitey. And they hadn't seen a white face in this village where I was in Africa. And they didn't care that I didn't have arms and legs. They just cared that I was white. <laughs> and it was so funny. So uh, because of an interaction with him, I was kind of, uh, and I lost this spatula. And this is like an opposition device. So I could go to Uganda. I could climb mountains in Nepal. I climbed the Himalayas in Nepal. I left my fake legs in Kathmandu, and I did it on my, my stump ends with, my, with uh, some covers on the ends of my knees. Um, but I couldn't go without my spatula, my, my opposition device. And uh, because of an interaction with this little boy, Trevor, and I lost it, and Trevor found it. And Trevor, like, he's got a juice box with beer caps that he's using at a little car, right? Like, that was his toy. And so finding something like this would have been super cool. But he knew it was important to me, and it belonged to me. And he was like three or four. He was tiny. And he, got, he gave it back to me. So now I call this Trevor. <laughs> and so this is my Trevor. And you guys are my Trevor. You guys are the ones that facilitate opportunities for me and are my, like my right hand that gives me the possibility to be here today with you and be out and living in a completely amazing life where, where not only am I living an amazing life, oh, yeah, I ski and sail and travel the world, but I also feel like a valuable contributor. I think it's important not to just to participate, but that I, I am a valuable contributor too. But I, I need Trevors. I need you folks to be the ones that set me up for success to make that happen, uh, which is phenomenal. And I, I mentioned in 
Uganda and in Nepal and trekking in Nepal and doing Nepal without my, my legs on. And one of the, because it was so unique in Nepal, uh, there aren't a lot of people with disabilities in Nepal. And uh, partly because there isn't a lot of food. So I kind of, I share this story about donkeys first and then I bring it back to people. And what I saw was like this one donkey and it had colorful saddle and it had bells and it kind of jingled when it walked and it had a bit of meat on its bones. And then there were like 19 other donkeys behind it carrying lots of stuff, uh, but skinny and starving by the looks of them. But they're following the donkey with all the bells and whistles. And what they do is they don't have enough food for all 20 donkeys. So they feed one donkey really well and make it colorful and put the bells and whistles on it. And then that way, all the other donkeys, they get more bang for their food. They don't have enough food for 20 of them, but because it's so decorated, it causes all 20 of them to follow it because there isn't enough food. And it's sort of the same in the villages where they feed the one person that brings the most food to the village. So if you're going out and, and, and you know, doing the rice crops and taking care of things, then you're going to be fed well enough to be able to work, to be able to bring food back to everybody. And so people with disabilities, they don't have the accessibility that we have. They don't have the technology we have. They don't have the awareness we have. They don't have artificial legs like my fancy artificial legs. Uh, you know, it's, so they, they are, people with disabilities aren't necessarily able to contribute and are not seen as able to contribute. So because they're not able to contribute, they're not fed. And if you're not fed, you slowly die off. And if, you're, you know, if, my, if my stumps aren't protected, I would get cuts on my knees and I'd get infection and I'd die off as well. So there weren't a lot of people with disabilities in Nepal. So when I was trekking through Nepal, they, uh, it, it went village to village. People started telling the next village that this unusual person was coming. So people would come from all around to see who, who I was. And there was this suspension bridge over the Modai Kola River, which was like an 840-foot descent from the suspension bridge. And I didn't have my legs on. So the suspension bridge are like, like for me, the lines for the suspension bridge were like up above my head. They weren't beside me. They were over my head. And they weren't AODA code. <laughs> there was planks missing, and there were lines missing. And, and so when I got to the other and the wind was blowing that day, so it was like this swinging suspension bridge. So I got to the other side. And my heart was like pumping. I did not feel like stopping because of my heart pumping. And it was exhausting doing the Himalayas. It was amazing. So I wanted to go while I had this extra energy. And so I left my group. I went ahead and I traveled with a Susma, a Nepalese student who could speak English. And this big walking SpongeBob SquarePants <laughs> was coming at me. And it was actually just like a big hay bale with tiny little legs which actually had a tiny little farmer underneath this hay bale. And all of a sudden, and I'm, I'm looking up at the hay bale, and the hay bale starts like waffling on the, on the legs, and it gets thrown to the ground. I thought it was going to like be buried underneath this hay bale. And the Nepalese farmer says to the student, he's like, if this one looks like that, and they meant me without my arms and without my legs, what does the rest of the group look like? And, uh, and, and they'd replied, oh, they don't have a head. Somebody doesn't have a head. And it was, you know, just silly, right? You're not even knowing whether to laugh or not. It's so ridiculous. So it was so neat that somewhere like Nepal, where there isn't awareness, isn't legislation, isn't technology, it, it's appropriate that they have the belief that people with disabilities can't contribute. But that this student that had traveled with me after nine days could get to a place of awareness because of being together that she could make a joke as, oh, one of them doesn't have a head. Like she realized that, that was just a silly question. And it was because of just being together, just being integrated. There wasn't any big awareness or legislation or a fancy ramp built. It was just being together. And so that's what's so great about kids in your classrooms is any opportunity that they can get to be together because awareness in Nepal happened, then the awareness in your classroom can totally happen and achieve all of these fantastic benefits of increased socialization, increased physical collectivity, and so many improved qualities of life. And how great that I get to also improve other people's quality of life. And so to recap, 
People with disabilities have more sedentary time. <laughs> so get us participating so that we can all feel a sense of accomplishment, every single one, universally, not just people with disabilities. And there really is something for everybody. This is Bacha. Is this wheelchair basketball or wheelchair rugby? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why are there two people running in this picture? One's a guide. One's a guide. Yes, one person has a visual impairment. Yeah. Yep, yep. And so there's tons of sport possibilities. In uh, red is the summer, in blue is the winter, in gre green is pretty much any old time. So if you can't find something that you might enjoy doing and to celebrate with your kids that they're able to do, there's even more that aren't on this list. And so we can't have, we say at Canadian Paralympic Committee, people on the podium if we don't have kids playing in the playground. Instead of me in grade two with a grade six person sitting in the classroom with me playing games on the chalkboard while all the other kids are outside playing. Like it makes no sense now, I can't imagine. But that's what, what my childhood was. I didn't have recess outside. And not just because I was tying everybody's shoelaces. <laughs> This is what studies have shown. 60% of them is that lack of awareness. So you guys can change that. Be the ones to make that change. Help us spread awareness. And so this is the download, education.paralympic.ca. And it's fun, creative lesson plans for your physical education class that all the kids can play. It doesn't just have to be about accessibility and integration. Education.paralympic. I see some photos being taken. I'll let you take. And I'm going to show you one more site. And so, and at the bottom, if you do have kids with disabilities or neighbors or uh, meet somebody in your volunteer work or in your classrooms, both Parasport Ontario and the Paralympic.ca site, Find Your Sport, can help people connect out into the community outside of your classroom for recreational activities for kids with disabilities. Or able-bodied kids. Like in sailing, we had twins, and one, one of the twins used a wheelchair, and the other was able-bodied, and they participated in skiing all the time. You see brothers, one with a visual impairment and one without, participating. It's just fun. It, this summer, for uh, goalball, people with a visual impairment goalball, for the very first time ever, we described the games. So there's augmentative communication, making it louder for people with a hearing impairment, uh, but now we have describers describing what's going on for people with a visual impairment. And he got so motivated that he went out and signed up for Parks and Rec Goalball. And uh, so he's with all these people with a visual impairment, and he's, he's sighted, but he wears the mask like everybody, so now he has a visual impairment. Uh, and he just did it for fun because it looked like a great game. So maybe all of you might be interested in registering for sitting volleyball, wheelchair basketball, maybe goalball. There's opportunities for everybody, and this is where you can find it. That's me, skiing, and that's Ian. That's the giant. <laughs> so once I got better at skiing, we got me some proper uh, prostheses, but it's hard to get funding for $3,000 ski boots when you've never ever skied before. So we had, to, we had to do it the creative way to get to a place where we could warrant a more official solution. And I, I went on in skiing to get a bronze medal. Thank you, Vega. <laughs> so here's some other links and resources. 
and we can certainly share these with your teacher. But it was uh, wonderful talking with you, but it's going to be even more fun for the next hour to participate in some of the physical activities of trying on some of these great opportunities. <laughs>